Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. In today's episode, I'm joined by Daryl Johnson and Jamie Kidd at Sorrell Private Trust here in Edmonton. Uh, they are uh, professional trustees, uh, which includes professional executor services, a service that I often uh, suggest that people should be using in my financial planning classes. Uh, this episode is good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, uh, no accident and sickness credits here in Alberta, sorry, Alberta folks, um, good for a financial planning credit as well, and good for an IAS credit. Um, we won't be submitting this one for an IROC credit, but we have really good news on the IROC front. And that is really starting in the new year, it becomes much easier for us to get stuff approved on the IROC side. And that should uh, open up starting in cycle nine, what will be then IROC cycle nine, that'll open up the opportunity for lots more stuff to get uh, accredited. So looking forward to that. All right, the object for today's episode is a t-shirt. Actually, I got this from uh, Joe Devaney. It's my Certified Tax Ninja t-shirt. So Certified Tax Ninja um, from Joe Devaney over at Video Tax News. Uh, Joe does uh, just a bang up business on the tax education side. So um, right across the country, there are accountants who go to sessions with Joe uh, to sort of keep current on tax issues. But I have sent a few students here and there to Joe's classes over the years as well. When somebody reaches out and said, you know what, I'd really like to have a better handle on sort of what happens on a tax return or something like that, then I will send that person, including actually one former guest on this podcast, I'll send that person to go see Joe. And I've heard nothing but good things from people that I've sent over there. One day I'll get to one of Joe's uh, three-day sessions. I have attended a couple of his uh, two-hour sessions, webinars that he does on various topics, and I subscribe to a bunch of his uh, services. One of my highlights every month is getting the 10-minute uh, video tax news update. So yeah, thanks for the shirt, Joe. I don't know if uh, I'll ever get Joe listening to my podcast. It's a little bit adjunct to what he does, but uh, yeah, great service. All right, let's uh, go into the interview. Uh, lots of content here, and you'll hear that uh, really I get to learn a lot in this conversation. It's my first time having a real sort of meaty conversation with uh, professional trustees about what they do. Hi, I'm joined today by Daryl Johnson and Jamie Kidd at Sorrell Private Trust. And uh, Daryl and Jamie provide a service that I talk about quite a bit in, in my classes, but never had the opportunity to have anybody on the podcast who does this. And that, of course, is the private trust service. And before we get into what that entails, I'm hoping to just get a quick intro. Daryl, do you mind leading us off here? Oh, sure, definitely. Um, so uh, I'm Daryl Johnson. Um, we've uh, been up and running here at Sorrell Private Trust for just over six years now. Uh, my background is uh, mainly banking. I was with ATB Financial for 16 plus years and did uh, a wide variety of uh, things uh, in the bank from audit to retail banking, to uh, lending, to HR, um, sort of regional operations management as well too. So, uh, and then uh, I joined the trust company uh, on our first day of operations. Okay, perfect. And uh, Jamie? Um, I'm a trust lawyer. I, uh, uh, I, I call myself a trust boy more than anything. Uh, I've been at it uh, over 30 years now. You can tell by my hairline. Um, I practiced for a while and then was recruited to an institutional trust company here in Edmonton and worked uh, at that trust company for, oh gosh, five, six years. Was, we're talking many years ago and uh, had a young family and moved off to Bermuda for a number of years, uh, ran a trust company there eventually, and then uh, came back home. And, and I'm uh, sure as we're watching winter just closing in on us at Edmonton, you're not thinking about those Bermuda days at all? I think about it every day, about the third week of September, the humidity drops in Bermuda and from September through till April, the weather's beautiful. So yes, I think about it every single minute. <laughs> My kids remind me. <laughs> Not to uh, drag it old scars or anything like that here, but yeah. No worries. I'm, yeah. Um, and of course you're both in Edmonton as you mentioned, Jamie. So thanks, that's good. Um, 
although I understand you do work across uh, across all, I think Western Canada. Do I have that right? So we are we're uh, licensed and regulated by the province of Alberta, and so our trust license is uh, just for here in Alberta. So this is the only place that we can literally hang a shingle. Um, so we can't hang a shingle in any other province unless we were a federal trust company, which we're not. Um, but uh, we can certainly do business and we do have clients in other provinces of Canada and indeed outside of Canada. Okay, perfect. Um, and can I ask what brought both of you to this work? And maybe Jamie, you wanna kick us off here? Oh boy, that's, that's, that's a tough question. I, I, I know that you kind of gave us a, a prelim and I had to think about it a little. Death. Uh, I have a, a lot of family members that uh, passed away when I was younger and it's not a fascination with death. It's just, I, I think maybe more than anything, it's an empathy for people going through the process more than anything. You see how difficult it is from many yeah. perspectives, right? And you thought this yeah. is something I'm going to help yeah. with? Like, yeah. Yeah, sure. we're, there's a lot of satisfaction of working with families and sort of helping them through um, times that are, you know, obviously very difficult. So makes good sense. So now can and I, I can you give us the sort of elevator pitch as to what Sorel does? Sure, I'll let sure. Daryl take that one. Sure. Yeah, I'll share. Um, yeah. So, uh, so Jason, we uh, act as a peer fiduciary. As Jamie mentioned, we're licensed and registered in the province of Alberta. Um, and we offer personal trust services, and that's all we do. And what that means is we uh, can act as uh, executors under people's wills. So oftentimes we'll be appointed as executor when they draft their estate documents. Uh, we can act as attorneys under their enduring powers of attorney. Uh, we act as a trustee under um, intervivalist trusts, uh, family trusts, or under any testamentary trusts as well, as well too. Um, and then uh, with those three uh, different types of appointments, we can uh, act in a variety of capacities. So either uh, not only executor, but we can be co-executor, contingent executor, agent for executor, things of that nature as well too. So we can work with the family members. Uh, and then overriding everything is we provide also family office services as well too. So what that means is we uh, work with families to uh, help uh, basically transition wealth from, from one generation to another. And, and what that means is we facilitate communication between the family members. So everybody knows, you know, what, how they participate in the family's wealth. And we, uh, we work with them to uh, uh, come up with uh, family governance uh, and ultimately uh, a family constitution, which is basically sort of the roadmap that the family follows to, to ensure that, you know, wealth is, is preserved uh, from one generation to the next. So I want to delve in, I know that I'm going to go off script already here, but uh, delve into the um, family office services a little bit. Is this really more of a, like, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but it's like a coincidence that you have this fiduciary role. And then much of what you do there is really, let's say, like emotion management or psychology. Is that how you see yourself in that family office no. capacity? Or is it more of a technical job? No. So I, we're not we're not trained psychologists by any means. I uh, just asked my wife. Um, <laughs> she'd call me her present husband if that was the case. Um, no, so uh, the idea of the family, it, we are a family office trust company. And the reason behind that is obviously when you're transferring wealth to the next generation, it involves a lot of structures. Structures such as Daryl's mansion, wills, powers of attorney, um, trusts, um, corporate vehicles, partnerships, you name it. And so you can set up all the structures that you want, um, but that doesn't necessarily ensure that it'll last through the generations. Um, what helps, it's just very simple, communication. Communication between the generations is what helps um, wealth and the purposes behind it last through the succeeding generations. And so as a family office trust company, helping families facilitate the creation of family governance and family constitutions, um, that's the communication piece. And that's what helps facilitate it transferring through uh, the generation. So the structures are basically the bricks of a building. And so if you don't have any mortar between the bricks, the building's gonna fall down. So the mortar between the bricks is the communication, the family governance stuff. 
So we also offer other family office, virtual family office services that uh, uh, any family of wealth would need, such as accounting, uh, consolidated reporting, um, property management, you name it. Um, we hire the best people and get the best services for families that we deal with. But uh, the centerpiece of it is the family governance. Okay, perfect. So you're really like the, the kind of quarterback in those relationships? Exactly. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so now, um, of course, you went through the list of offerings here. And when I bring this up in class, one of the very first hesitations that I always hear is around cost. So how do you present the, the cost here? And I know it's kind of hard to say, like it's going to cost X amount of dollars exactly, but you must have to have this conversation around cost fairly regularly. Yeah, we do. Um, we, uh, uh, one of the things with us being, uh, you know, a smaller independent trust company is we offer we, we're bespoke services to family clients. So, so while we, we do offer you know, the four main services, we try to tailor the services to each family depending on what their circumstances are because no two families are alike. Um, and then overriding that, you know, there's, there's certain um, rules that we have to follow, like within the province of Alberta, you can't charge more than 5% um, uh, to act as an executor on an individual's will and and actually the the going rate is is normally a lot less than that so um so for instance what we would do is we like to have conversations with clients and sort of find out what their particular situation is and then we take a look at it from a qualitative and a quantitative standpoint so how difficult is it going to be to say administer an estate um you can have you know two different estates you know one could be worth well, Jamie has an example of he did an estate once that was worth $100 million, but it was all in T-bills and it was quite easy to administer. Uh, you can have a, you know, you can have a $3 million estate with like four different operating companies and, uh, you know, uh, cross-border property and, and multiple beneficiaries. It could be a lot more difficult to administer. So we take a look at that and then we um, take a look at what the overall value is and then we make a proposal to a client. Um, and the... If you get down to the actual details, the, the actual fee is sort of a sliding scale. So, you know, we would charge a certain percentage for the first, usually first million dollars and a lower percentage for the next two, and it just kind of decreases. Uh, so for the larger estates, um, when we get up into the larger dollar values, the, the cost for that portion of it is quite reasonable. Right. Like a $10 million estate is not usually 10 times more complicated than a million dollar estate. No, definitely not. So... Although I'm sure then, you see some there, all right? Oh well, yes. <laughs> yeah. We um, try to we try to flip it on its ear, and as opposed to uh, our competitors uh, who like to uh, here's a fee schedule, um, here's a round peg fitting into a square hole. Um, we'd like to get to know uh, the prospective clients and understand what their situation is. And it sounds simple, but we like to apply common sense. What, what's reasonable in the circumstances for these particular clients and, and their circumstances. Yeah. So is that like a written proposal then? Is that what you would do here? Yeah. Client comes to you, you do like an hour sort of discovery, go through issues and yeah. come back. Yeah, okay. Definitely, yeah. And then, you know, with the case of an executor appointment, for instance, I mean, we'll, um, you know, people are, are at different stages, right? So some people might come to us while they're doing the process of rewriting their wills. Uh, some folks might come to us and they're, they're right at the beginning stages. So, so we'll walk them through. Uh, we can refer them to uh, lawyers who will draft uh, well-written documents uh, that will give powers to the executor uh, to make sure that the estate is administered uh, properly. And we'll, you know, we always commit to folks that we'll get them to the finish line so they have well-drafted estate documents. Um, and then, you know, if we're appointed, great. If not, um, that's fine too. Um, and how the fees for executor works go or executor work goes is we don't get paid until we act. So, uh, and that's obviously after the individual has passed away. So, so you could be sowing a seed for decades down the road in some of these cases. Yeah, that's, that's what our intent is. So. Um, so can we just, since you brought up this issue of working for people drafting wills here, is there a specific language? Like, would you send that person to uh, a preferred lawyer or whatever the case? And, and there's language that, that has to go into the will for you to do this work? Or how does that work out? 
So we, uh, we uh, quarterback was a word that you used earlier and that's, that's a great word. Thanks, Jason. We, we quarterback the process for the client. Um, we understand what their wishes are because it's all about them. It's not about us. And we help facilitate with um, the instructions to the lawyer uh, so that their intentions are, are get across clearly. And of course, the clients uh, have to speak with the lawyer to clarify what those instructions are properly and legally. Um, but uh, we review documents and to ensure that uh, there's proper language within, within the documents that can help us administer the estate or the trust properly. Um, but uh, aside from that, the, the clear intentions of the testator or the, the settler are, um, that's expressed by them directly to the lawyer or the accountant. Sorry, to the lawyer, <laughs> we're not giving it to the accountants. <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and so we'll review the drafts that come through um, but quite frankly, there's, I mean, the, the trust and estate bar in Alberta is, is not large. And so we work with, you know, most of counsel that's in the estate and trust bar, and they're all really great professionals. So most of the times it's just kind of making sure that things aren't missed. And, and most of the time it's, it's very minor stuff that, uh, that may get missed. That makes a lot of sense. I'm guessing then this is so much easier when you have that like family office type of relationship, you know, you, you know, the players, you've talked about values, you know, the governance structure. I, I'm sure that that makes it much easier to put that stuff into a will. Is that fair? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Definitely. Now, do you get brought into cases here where there's a, like somebody has died and the will is a mess. Does that, is that part of your offerings as well? I, J Daryl, is this normal for you or? Well, not, not normal, but we certainly do. Um, there's uh, cases where, uh, and it, it really comes down to how the original will was drafted. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, we could list a bunch of different examples. You know, you, you know somebody who might have four kids and they um, appoint the eldest as the executor and then the other three are left out and there's bad blood between the children. Um, you know, there's, or they appoint all four as executor and they can't get, get along. Um, and so when, when uh, things kind of go sideways like that, there's uh, an opportunity for us to get involved. Um, we'll often get referrals from lawyers that might be in the midst of litigating a will um, among family members. And one of the solutions that's offered is, you know, let's, let's, let's appoint a corporate executor who has no family bias, who has no uh, skin in the game to administer the will properly and, um, and take it forward from there. So that's an opportunity uh, for us and has been in the past. Um, and then there's other, other times where, you know, if somebody has passed away and, you know, maybe they have appointed a trusted family friend to be executor. And then, I mean, it's not easy being an executor in a will. It's, it's a lot of work and uh, it takes a long time. Um, so they may say, you know what, I'm still going to be executor, but I'll, I'll appoint uh, you folks as my agent. So we'll do all the work for them. Um, but then we're in constant contact with them uh, as far as approving things and, you know, uh, making sure that it's administered properly and just so they're kept up to speed. But but it all the heavy lifting is taken off of their, their plate. So that's another option for us as well, too. After okay. somebody's passed yeah. away. Thanks, Daryl. Um, now, just the idea, like you sort of give these fairly large quantums for the value of a state, right? You know, we kind of started at a million dollars. What's the smallest estate where somebody could realistically engage your services? Well, an estate under a million dollars um, typically would not be, it wouldn't be prudent for a, a family for us to get involved. I, we do, we are in business and so we, we charge a fee and we don't want to be taking the party taking the biggest share of the pie. I mean, it's someone sets up their will for their beneficiaries. We don't want to be uh, uh, taking taking their money away from them when they can uh, they can do it themselves. But we we can. And there's times that we'll give guidance to people, but uh, right. we're very careful about that. We don't want to be uh, seen as acting as an executor or a trustee. 
Yeah, I'm sure this is challenging. And I'm, I'm always surprised, you know, you, you hear court cases where people go to battle over estates and, you know, fight over 50 or $100,000 estates in some cases. And I just think, yeah. you know, great. Like, if you could have had better professional advice, maybe that wouldn't have happened. But there is that challenge right now. People at the end are willing to go pay for lawyers. And I know that's not cheap either. So oh, you yeah. have to pay for litigators. So. Usually it's the things that people fight over, which is which is odd, but people have a personal attachment to them. Yeah. Do you find just going back to the the sort of family meetings before that you talked about, you talked about the value of communication here. Do people bring up those issues at the right times? Like if they're in the family meeting, do the do the sore spots come out there? Um, yes. I mean, so communication is key. Like if, if you have a family that's um, maybe we're not necessarily providing the family office services at that stage, maybe they're not at, um, that's not an interest or an intent or a need. Um, the communication aspect is still very key. So uh, communicating with family members as to, okay, this is how our estate's going to be divided and why is very important. Having those discussions early, it solves so many problems. And having them, as you said, in a family meeting, not just individually one off with, um, you know, the son or the daughter or the youngest son or whatever, it, having everybody, so everybody's on the same page while mom and dad are still alive. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. A lot of times it doesn't. And it will, will recommend that that happens. But I mean, if we're engaged, solely in the role of an attorney and executor and we're not doing family office work then we typically don't you know have in-depth interviews with the children you know we'll just be dealing with the the testators um but you know there's lots of folks that that for you know for personal reasons they don't want to share anything some some folks don't want their kids to know how much they're worth until after they're dead um and you know some folks want to try to rule from the grave and you know so so in those instances, it could be a little uh, dicey, right? So you find yourself, and I know you have to be careful. Here, like you have a the client comes to you with an intention. They say, I, I want to, and I know they won't say rule from beyond the grave, but essentially no. that's how they, they'll they have that sort of set of intentions. Yeah. Do you, can you push back at that? Or do you kind of have to take instruction and, and run with it? Um, so you mean if, uh, an exec, if a testator is wanting to exclude a beneficiary type of thing? Uh, that's a good example, right? So where you can see that excluding that beneficiary might lead to litigation later on, Jamie, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we definitely encourage communication at all levels. Um, but as Daryl says, it's difficult at times. The family doesn't necessarily want us to get involved if we're just acting as an executor or an attorney. Um, but we, we certainly encourage it. And it's, it's about preparing uh, the next generation for what's to come. Yeah. And if everybody's on the same page, um, that's not going to hurt. This may, this may change. Uh, COVID may have changed things in this regard, that people maybe are a little more communicative. Um, certainly people, people don't like talking about death and dying. Uh, but we've certainly found during the pandemic that people, you know, they've Put this under their uh, in their shelf, and they've dusted it off, and and they're talking about it and thinking, well, it's, it's changed their perspective that this is something they need to deal with, from updating their wills and and powers of attorney and so forth. Um, so maybe the communication piece may follow. I don't know. Yeah, that that's a fair point. It's uh, again one of those silver linings with COVID. Maybe is a little bit of willingness yeah. to accept that reality. Now, just going back, you said you do up this proposal for clients, you come to them, you say, here's going to be your rough set of costs. And here's the benefit of engaging us. Is there, um, from the client's perspective, then do, do people sort of take that? Or do some people say, uh, you know, too much to spend here, and I'd rather just go do it on my own? What, what does that conversation look like? Daryl, if you want to take us down that sure. road. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's our proposal is a starting point for an additional conversation is how we look at it. So, I mean, it's not something that is set in stone. Um, you know, we, we have to take a look at it from a business perspective. Uh, you know, we're, we're not, um, you know, we're, 
you know, we, we need to be paid reasonably, but we want to make sure that everybody's comfortable, right? That people are having, um, that they're getting value um, for the services that we provide. So, so we're certainly open to have another conversation. Um, what we do uh, include in our proposal is we're very transparent as far as fees go so we tell them what our proposal is and then we give them a, an average aggregate of what our, our competitors will charge and nine times out of ten we come in um you know lower uh just because we don't have the same overhead as as the large institutional trust companies do so there's value there um and and it really depends on the individual you know the we have some folks that say well what do i care i'm going to be you know gone when I, when I have to pay for this. Um, and other people are, you know, they're very mindful of, you know, what's going to be left um, to their family. And, and, and it's not only family, but to charity and things of that nature. And, you know, it's really is about the, the, the testator. So, so we just want to make sure everybody's comfortable. So, but if it's, um, you know, if, if we don't agree, you know, and we have no hard feelings, you know, we're, uh, we're open. We still get them th through to the, um, uh, end phase of, of making sure that they have good estate documents because like you know five years down the road they may have to update their rules again because you know yeah. life life happens <laughs> so maybe there's new grandkids or whatever and they may just remember hey i talked to these guys five years ago and they they helped me get things done maybe it's time to reconsider what we did back then back to the sowing the seeds conversation earlier right exactly yes yeah okay perfect now do you have some people who go away who don't they, they, they don't want to pay the price. They say it's too much, too much cost for my estate. And you just are left thinking, well, they're going to end up in court. Is that, I don't, I need to be careful how you answer that, well, but um, Jamie? No, never really a fear of that. Uh, yeah. It sounds cocky, but you know, we're, we're, we apply a common sense approach and we're quite reasonable um, in that approach. And we have the discussions uh, as Daryl said, we're very transparent. Nine out of ten times, uh, it's really we 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 retain the client and we, yeah. we engage the client, and so it's really ten percent of the time. So it's a pretty good success rate. So that's the cocky part. Um, <laughs> I hope it continues that way. Uh, and no hard feelings, as Daryl said, we've sowed the seeds for down the road, yeah. and uh, we're generally trying to help these folks. And if they don't appoint us, we'll help them get on the right path. And then five, 10 years later, they may say, these guys didn't charge me a thing, but they helped me out. Let's give them a try. Nice. It makes a lot of sense. Thanks. And I like that approach too. I think you use that word common sense a couple of times in there, Jamie, I get that. I can see how that's appealing in an area like this that can be so complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, can we just go through sort of what each type of engagement would look like? So the one that that I'm most interested in, of course, is the professional executor. So what would a typical executor engagement look like? I don't know, Daryl, if you want to take us through this. Sure. Um, so if we're appointed as an executor, as I think I mentioned earlier, we, um, you know, we don't uh, act uh, until the individual has passed away, right? So, uh, so it's, um, it's obviously a very important role because, you know, you're, you're, um, so there's, there's a process that we have to go through. So there's like sort of pre probate, um, but, you know, but our initial, uh, initial responsibility is securing, uh, assets and making sure that, uh, the assets are being kept safe, uh, and secure, uh, for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Um, there's a lot of work that goes through and it really, uh, the states are different, like, you know, so it's. Um, you know, we've gone through, you know, searching through people's houses, you know, Jamie's had a story, we had a, an estate a few, quite a few, yeah, about three or four years ago, and, you know, a, a nice house, but, you know, we're going through books and stuff, and it was a, a nice old lady who passed away, and, and, you know, we're finding like $50 bills stuffed in, in books and things of that nature, right, so it's just, going through and making sure you, you do your due diligence and um and then uh there's all sorts of administrative stuff that needs to happen so you know if if there is a home uh we need to make sure the home is secured and insured uh we need to take care of any utility payments uh we need to handle the uh, you know the last last wishes for funeral and burial and that sort of sort of thing uh, gets taken care of as well too um 
And then it's just a, a litany of, of administrative things that need to happen uh, up until we get to the point where we're able to apply, make application for probate. And we'll work with a lawyer to make that application. We'll do all the, the uh, upfront legwork. And, and what that entails is um, coming up with an assets and liabilities report. So you're listing all the assets, all the liabilities. So you're doing a lot of detective work up front and, and then coming uh, up with the grand total that would form part of the application for probate. Uh, and then there is some information around beneficiaries. So we would work with the lawyer to make that application. And then the lawyer would make application on our behalf to the court. Um, and then once um, we have probate and probate has been granted, as Jamie likes to say, you know, that's kind of our admission ticket. So we have, then we have actual physical control of all the assets. So we can, we can actually sell things, consolidate things, uh, handle investments if that's necessary. Um, you know, and like you say, the, 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 there's no two estates are the same. So it's really a, a variety of things that happen. Uh, you know, there's, you know, things like contents of homes that we need to take care of. You know, we have a group of folks that we, that we deal with and we go through and sort of catalog everything. And we work with uh, auction houses to, to, to do that sort of stuff if it's required. And then you, you and throughout this whole process, you know, you're in, in constant uh, communication with beneficiaries, right? Because they're the ones that, um, are ultimately going to benefit from, from, from the will. And then, you know, you overlay that with all the tax requirements and the accounting that needs to happen. So we need to make uh, um, all the applicable uh, tax filings uh, that need to happen. Uh, and then, you know, you're waiting for assessments from CRA so you can kind of move on to the next step. And, and you know, it's a long process until you get to the end where you everything is sort of tied up neat with a bow and then you make an application for a clearance certificate and once the clearance certificate is done then then you're fine to release the final funds to the beneficiaries and at, it's at that point in time where we get paid okay so you're really again like all the long game with this business right here yeah yeah okay so, and i i don't know if i forgot anything jamie if you wanted to add anything with this no you, you nailed it it's very much a process it's a hurry up and wait process you you hurry up and do a set of tasks, then go to the next one, and then so forth. You're ultimately hurrying up and waiting for Revenue Canada for most of the length of the process. Yeah, yeah. which makes a lot of sense. And I've heard that these are particularly long waits today. Is that, uh, is that what you're seeing? Or they, I am. Uh, we are. But uh, I, I heard of one uh, estate that got a clearance certificate within six weeks, just oh. this week, which was that's unheard of right so yeah I, I think it's an anomaly i take these things <laughs> anecdotally <laughs> like it yeah. accidentally fell to the top of the pile something like that yeah. exactly yeah yeah i mean I, i've been on hold with the cra for like hours <laughs> you know yeah. i just i just put it on speakerphone and listen to the music and do other <laughs> things until somebody picks up <laughs> I think just that idea of waiting on hold, like getting paid to wait on hold for CRA, that's, uh, I mean, I, I would happily pay somebody for the number of times I have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, what about power of attorney engagements? Uh, Daryl gave us the, the great rundown of what the estate looks like. Uh, Jamie, I'm sure that power of attorney engagements are even more varied. Is that accurate or um, you see Well, here? it's sadly the the power of attorney engagements that we get in get enacted when our appointment gets enacted is when uh, someone's declared incompetent or uh, incapacitated I should say uh, mentally or physically um, and typically obviously an elderly person that may suffer from dementia and uh, so they need someone to take care of their finances um, when that happens. And so a, a typical situation would be where someone's, as I say, is, uh, suffers from dementia and Alzheimer's um, and our appointment gets kicked in according with the terms of the enduring power of attorney, which is typically a declaration by a, a doctor, typically their doctor or two doctors or however they've had it drafted in their, in their document. Um, and so then we go in and take care of their finances on their behalf in accordance with their wishes. So, um, you know, their care and maintenance and, and standard of living is, is P 
paramount to them. And so that's that's our goal is to make sure that they're taken care of financially and their standard of living stays the way they had intended in accordance with the EPA. Um, and uh, then that appointment ceases when the individual passes. And then typically in that case, we've also been appointed as the executor. And so then that's when that appointment kicks in with the process that Daryl's described. Do you so find, it, oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. It, it doesn't always kick in. I mean, I hope I'm 88 or 89 or 90 and uh, pass and I've got all my marbles and I pass away in my sleep, but that's not, not always the case. Um, so as opposed to something that folks of, you know, viewers of your podcast, that there's also a personal directive, which is, so your enduring power of attorney takes care of an individual's finances, whereas a personal directive takes care of your health. They have the, um, take care of your wishes with respect to your, you know, what your health requirements are, um, uh, how you want to be taken care of and so forth when, when you become incapacitated as well. So EPA deals with wealth, personal directive deals with health. We don't act in any capacity whatsoever with a personal directive, only on an EPA and during power of attorney and wills. That yeah, and that makes sense. I think that often the personal directive is like that's more family oriented, yes. right? That's somebody yeah. who's going to be in the hospital with that person. Yeah, we actually had uh, I don't know if you'd know this fellow, but a fellow named Dr. Darren Highland on a previous episode talking about personal directives and really good actually. So well, good. yeah. Um, and yeah, I, again, I feel personal directives are hugely important and yeah. often overlooked. So I'm glad you brought that up, Jamie. That's great. And what about trustee roles then? I know those both overlap quite a bit, but the, I know the trustee job is sometimes different as well. What does that type of engagement look like? Uh, Daryl, if you want to take us through that. Oh, sure. So there's, um, you know, there's uh, uh, different types of trusts. Um, you know, a trust that you can create while you're alive, which is an inter vivos trust. And then trusts that are created under your will, which are testamentary trusts. So, um, you know, typically an intervivals trust would be, uh, uh, might come into effect if, if uh, somebody does an estate freeze, uh, if there's a family business, um, or, um, you know, there's certain circumstances where, where uh, their families want to create a family trust while they're alive to help facilitate transfer of wealth to, to next generations. So what we do there is, um, as trustee, you have a, you know, you you're held to a high standard. So basically um, the trustee has actual legal ownership of all the property within the trust. But uh, even though we have legal ownership, we're, we're holding it uh, to the benefit of the beneficiaries that are named in the trust. So, uh, so again, it's a lot of communication uh, with the beneficiaries. Um, you know, if there is, uh, you know, we need to make sure that any all decisions are documented that regular meetings happen all tax filings are taken care of um any requests that are made we need to you know have uh, document those and have uh discussions as to whether or not we're going to honor those requests um and then on the flip side like testamentary trusts are, are you know typically created um uh I, you know, I'll just use myself as, as an example, you know, my will, uh, there's a, I've got an 18 year old daughter and, you know, I'm not giving her all of my money, not that there's very much of it, uh, but I'm not going to give it to her outright when she's 18 years old. So there's a, so in that case, it would be a testamentary trust that would be created. And, um, you know, there's usually provisions for education and maintenance in the testamentary trust. So if my, uh, so if I pass and my daughter wants to go to university, you know, her costs will be covered. Uh, and then, you know, she'll, uh, and then any other requests that she have, she has, you know, the trustee of the testamentary trust uh, has discretion as to whether or not they're going to honor them. And so those are the types of decisions we would make. And then um, under a testamentary trust for a child, um, you know, there's typically milestones. They may get a certain portion at age 25 and a certain portion at age 28, and then maybe the remainder at 32. It really depends on what, what the comfort level of the testator is. So there, there's a wide range of, of uh, different circumstances that people follow with those. So you're, and again, you're just basically managing uh, those funds in the testamentary trust, uh, if it's money or if it's property or whatever it is that it is in the trust uh, for the benefit of beneficiaries. 
Okay. Yeah. And of course, those, like you said, the trust could be any number of things. Your example of your daughter, where maybe you're not uh, wanting to give an 18 year old a, a bunch of money or all your money, anyways, at one time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I think we've covered it a fair bit already, but is there anything else on the family office services that being sort of your fourth line of business, as I understand it, anything we didn't talk about as to what you do on the family office services side? No, I, I think it just, as, as we mentioned before, it, it ties in with all the other structures. It really is the mortar between the bricks of those structures. Yeah, yeah. I can really see how this tie, like, how having that engagement first and foremost lets you do everything else so much more effectively, right? Yeah, yeah. and it's, um, you know, and then just to, as a, another point, you know, around the fee question, you know, if, if we're appointed as a trustee under a uh, family, family trust, we'll offer family office uh, services for them as part of our trustee fee, like we don't charge extra for that. Yeah. Um, however, we do have families that, um, it, specifically engage us just to, to walk them through the, the constitution and governance standpoint where we're not acting as trustee. So, so that would be sort of a standalone fee that we would just sort of work out a deal with the family and have different milestones as far as uh, the work that we do. And, and that uh, might be yeah. where the family themselves is gonna act as trustee after everything is settled and they, they just wanna know they're doing it right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or they may not even have a trust. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true too, yeah. yeah. That's a, yeah, that's fair. Like they'll do a, a freeze without a trust, for example, and again, make sure the structure and governance is all done properly. That's what you mean here, Jamie? That's... Or, or they may not have even done a freeze. They just, uh, um, they may not have had a require a need for that, uh, or they haven't thought, they, they're, they could be uh, transferring wealth through their wills, Yeah. right? Makes sense. I mean, yeah. It's just, an, I'm not saying that it's a common situation, but you know, definitely occurs that not, not everybody has a trust. Yeah. And so, but, but everybody needs communication between the generations. Yeah. And, you know, if, if mom and dad aren't comfortable sort of having those conversations with the kids, you know, we can certainly come in and, and facilitate those. So, you know, typically we would have, you know, a conversation with mom or dad or mom and dad together initially, just to get what their wishes are. And then, you know, if there's three kids, we'll eat we'll meet with each one of them individually to sort of get their perspective on everything. And then we'll have a family meeting and bring everybody together and say, okay, this is what we heard. Um, and just, you know, make sure that everybody's on the same page. That again, that idea, like the communication thing just brings through everything here, doesn't it? It's uh, unavoidable. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's overlooked, unfortunately. And so from, uh, it's a huge benefit for the family members and the families themselves as a unit. And I mean, quite frankly, it's a huge benefit to us. I mean, it, um, it mitigates our risk as a trustee, number one, and it, it's an opportunity for us to get to know the beneficiaries much better than we otherwise may have if that piece wasn't in place. And so that's mitigating our risk through the generations. Um, like they may not wanna change we, we may not be viewed as just mommy and daddy's trustee. Um, we're their trustee. We're the family trustee. And so the, the goal is that grandkids, great grandkids feel the same way. So, you know, we, we grow with them through the generations is the goal. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It's, you know, I teach the Chartered Life Underwriter course where we learn about trusts and we learn about high end insurance leverage and all this kind of stuff. But I, I do say that the number one tool you have available to achieve a successful estate plan is the family meeting, right? That's uh, absolutely, yeah. definitely. And it's, uh, you know, it's even, you know, nowadays families are quite a bit more complicated uh, or can be, I guess, than, than they were, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, now you've got, you know, if there's a family business, you might have some kids that are working in the business, some kids that aren't. Uh, you might have second marriages. You might have grandkids from first marriages. You might have, you know, all sorts of um, different scenarios that that could complicate things i guess so yeah that's i mean my family's exactly that daryl right we're very i mean uh, unconventional let's say but yeah that's i and i i hardly ever run into anybody today that you know looks like the families that that i grew up sort yeah. of around so yeah the cleavers uh, don't exist anymore <laughs> no that's true <laughs> they're they're the abnormality now jamie yeah right? absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. um so 
we've talked about this quite a bit, I guess. How long, let's say, with a power of attorney engagement or executor engagement, how long would these things go on for? Do you have, is it wrapped up in, I know they're going to be different for POA versus executor, but can you give a rough idea here? Well, so, so sadly, from a typical standpoint with an EPA, um, from my experience, they don't typically last that long, sadly, because uh, it's, it's, it's kind of near the end of someone's life, sadly, um, where it gets kicked in. And, and oftentimes, uh, we've had a situation where you get the EPA appointment and all the, the work goes in and then the individual passes on, um, which is terrible. I mean, it's a terrible step, but that's just kind of the way it works. Typically, it isn't that long. Um, for an estate, it depends on the assets, depends on the complexity of the estate, depends on where the assets are located, where the beneficiaries are located, um, a lot of different factors, but anywhere between one and two years, I think would be an average, kind of a, an average range. Um, if you were to do it on your own uh, as an individual where you don't have the experience and the processes that a corporate trustee such as we are, it could take much, much longer. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly heard of these going, and I have students who currently are dealing with these where they're five, seven, ten years into it. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I don't it's, it's not a that. fun job. I mean, Daryl's been asked, I know I, I get asked by family and friends, well, you've done this for years and years. Um, let me just appoint you personally. And yes, <laughs> certainly we have the processes and it's not fun. Like we enjoy it because of the people that we get to meet and the families we get to meet. And that's really the what drives me and I know drives Daryl. Um, but, you know, you don't wanna be doing this when you go home at night as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I had never even thought about that, about getting asked for that. That is a personal engagement, but I know that happens with financial advisors sometimes too. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, from a financial advisor standpoint, you know, they're good clients probably and they wouldn't ask for them to be executor unless they were a trusted advisor. So, you know, in that sense, it's an honor, but it's also, you know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's an honor you don't want. I certainly, yeah. I never, yeah. and even with family, I always, uh, I actively encourage my students to avoid that engagement with family. I think there's some conflicts of interest that can show up there. So yeah, yeah. Sources yeah. of liability, all that good stuff. Yeah. So, it's yeah. unfortunate, yeah. but it happens. Yeah. It's, it's reality today, like it or not, right? That's Now, um, on that note, I guess, can we talk about some of the things that you see go wrong with wills? What are some of the common sources of disputes here? Know, Jamie, if you have some war stories around this or how, how much you can share. Well, um, with wills where there's issues, I mean, they it's when they're poorly drafted. Um, and so that... <laughs> That comes down to uh, whoever drafted the will. Um, and certainly there can be litigation there, um, but typically it's dealt with in the courts uh, with advice and direction or however with um, however it, it, it occurs. That isn't a typical situation. Um, it's typically the disputes afterwards. Um, you may have a, the will was fine, um, but people are fighting over things saying, uh, mom and dad wanted this and to go to me and not to you. As I mentioned before, it's the things. I, I had an estate once where, um, you know, it was, it was a very large multi-million dollar estate going to two brothers and they weren't fighting over the millions of dollars. They were fighting over a freezer. And so why were they fighting over a freezer? Well, one of the brothers was a fisherman. And he wanted to keep his fish in the freezer. You know, you, you're getting millions of dollars. You can go buy your own freezer. Um, the other brother, uh, he didn't get along with his dad. And the one time he had a really good conversation was when dad bought the freezer and he helped him take it downstairs. And they sat and had a good chat, the first good chat, and put their backs against the freezer and had a beer. And so he had sentimental reasons why he wanted the freezer. And so these guys went at it and broke it up. But as an impartial, objective uh, trustee, executor, we, uh, we said, well, too bad, so sad. Nobody gets the freezer. And we sold the freezer. Um, <laughs> they, people fight over things. It's usually those are the things that people fight over. Um, and it all comes down to communication. 
right? Yep. If, if there was that communication between dad and the two sons while he was alive, um, there's a greater, greater chance that they wouldn't have <laughs> come to blows almost in our boardroom. That seems, I mean, ridiculous, but I've heard of things like that too, where it's, you know, something of inconsequential value. You could have go, gone and bought a second freezer. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. probably yeah. a much nicer freezer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, go shop for an antique and trick them, right? Yeah. I think that probably is a violation of your fiduciary duty, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just actually had a call uh, not that long ago from, it's not a file that we have yet, but they're, um, thinking about uh, it's it's in litigation right now. It's in the state, and, and there's four kids. Uh, two are appointed as executor, and two aren't. And the kids aren't getting along. The individual passed away like four and a half years ago, and nothing's been done with the estate. Um, and um, and you know, it's looking like one of the executors is kind of taking advantage, but we but nobody knows. So. So they're, uh, so that's, you know, sort of the family dynamics that can come into play. Um, well, that, that's a good point, Daryl, that, uh, you know, when you, you, you appoint your kids and you appoint a few of them, or you appoint one of them to be your executor and there are other children, it's like, okay, well, where's my money now? Right. And so even if uh, it's the good daughter that's doing it and she's doing the best she can, it isn't something that she typically does. And so she's under a lot of pressure from the family to deliver with what was intended in the will, but people get impatient over time, right? And so that helps with fostering discord in the family, which is what mom and dad wouldn't want, right? Yeah, that's, that's a good point around, you know, you might be doing everything right, but nobody does this job all the time. So everybody's gonna have um, artificial expectations. Exactly. And so, I mean, you can just think simple things, uh, a family of five, three kids. Um, how many times did one of the kids look at another of their siblings sideways and it ends up in a, an argument and a fight? Well, these things, these things, uh, continue on into adulthood yeah. only to a different level. Right. And now throw money into the mix and take yeah. mom and dad out of the mix. And you've got, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, what about uh, family law? Do you run into problems where family law steps on what's being done with the estate? Is this common or I don't know, Daryl, if you have any thoughts about that? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there is, you know, I, I think, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, but I mean, if the will is drafted properly, um, you know, and there's good instructions. And, you know, if, if we have a roadmap in order to administer it, um, that would, you know, that's the best. Um, you know, where it could get a little dicey is, you know, if you have, um, and we talked about, you know, second marriages and things of that nature, um, uh, you know, maybe grandkids either being left in or being left out um, or the second spouse, you know, getting the, the bulk of it and the, the kids don't get as much. Um, I mean, that's, I'm not sure, I mean, that wouldn't really be family law per se, but it's family circumstances that, that might lead to litigation. Um, and, you know, or if the testator wanted to uh, not include one of the beneficiaries and it came as a surprise, you know, that would be, but again, that's not really a family law thing. I mean, that's more of a, a state litigation piece. So I don't know, Jamie, you have anything? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the circumstances, really. Um, and so that's where good planning comes into, into play. And also uh, keeping the planning updated, like if there's divorce, um, if there's a change in circumstances, uh, where one of the spouses dies, I mean, it, it's, it's that constant communication with the clients. Uh, to make sure that their wills are updated and and, and valid. Yeah, exactly. And there's lots of, you know, and lots of circumstances where, you know, it may not be, I mean, the, it, there's a whole question of fair and equal distribution, right? So you've got, uh, you know, equal may not be fair, 
and you know, fair certainly couldn't isn't equal. I mean, there's lots of circumstances where, you know, you got three kids and one may not be getting as much because they got a a, a gift while mom and dad were alive, or you know. But that needs to be communicated, so it's you know, so they know that uh, you you got some of your inheritance before we passed away, and so in the will, you know, you, you may not be getting you know you know a third. You might be only be getting 20% and your siblings are going to get 40% each. So. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, so you've been great. Both of you have given, I think, really thorough answers that I hope will help our listeners understand the value of using a professional executor, professional trustee service. I'm hoping, is there any last messages that either of you have? I'll start with Jamie here for the financial advisors who are listening. Um. Well, communication. I mean, that's that's the nub of it. Uh, communicate with your clients and and see what their needs are. Uh, and uh, from the financial advisor standpoint, I mean, it, they know what questions to ask. Um, one of the questions from a client standpoint is, you know, if you're the spouse, do you really want to be administering an estate? Um, where we have value is that we're impartial. We're objective, we have experience. Um, and from that impartiality standpoint, you know, we empathize with what families are going through. Um, but boy, if you had all of that overloaded on you when your husband just passed and you have to administer the estate and you've got to take care of your kids maybe, um, that's a lot, that's a big load to put on on, an, on a personal executor. So, um, we can certainly help in that regard. And that's, yeah, that's was, where we, yeah. where our true value really comes in, I think. Yeah. I always think about this with the number of elections we talk about, you know, you're making all like, there's all these elections that are available for an executor. And I think you put a like surviving spouse in that position and they're dealing with all that other stuff. Yeah. And now you're going to make, you know, election after election or deal with those like nitpicky little tax things, right? It just seems like, yeah. I don't know, awkward anyways. Daryl? Um, no, yeah, I would echo Jamie's comment. I mean, the, you know, from a financial advisor standpoint, I mean, it's, you know, you're really, you know, I believe, you know, you're really helping your client if you ask uh, some of these questions and, uh, you know, get them to start thinking about it a little bit. And, uh, you know, you, you're um, at the very least, you know, you're, you're likely going to uh, increase your chances of, you know, retaining those investments after the, the individual passes. Uh, I know that's a big uh, concern, you know, uh, with the big transfer of wealth that's happening in the baby boomers right now that, you know, people want to make sure that assets are retained. So, so getting to, getting to know spouses and kids and asking those questions, I think helps um, with that. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to follow on here with one last comment of my own. And that is, I was introduced to the two of you by a financial advisor. Uh, Marshall has actually been a previous guest on the podcast here. And I think that this goes to building a good network of professionals. I think every financial advisor should have somebody like yourselves in their corner somewhere. And again, you're, I know you're not there for every possible engagement, but the sort of target market for a lot of financial advisors, you would be great resources to be uh, bringing in there. So, um, you know, for those that don't have somebody like uh, Daryl and Jamie in your corner, go find somebody. Hmm. Very nice of you to say. <laughs> Thanks very much. We we definitely take a very collaborative approach with with the professionals that we work with. I mean, the, the end goal is taking care of the client. I mean, our it's not our our overt mantra, but internally it is. We just our goal is to service the hell out of a client, and and that employs um, you know the services of other you know really uniquely qualified professionals. Part of the team. And yeah. And that'll reflect well back on the person who referred you as well. I totally see that, right? You bet. Okay. Well, that's great. I think you've been more than generous with your uh, time, knowledge, wisdom, and experience, and I really appreciate it. I'm happy to get to meet both of you, and I hope yeah. you both enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thanks, yeah. All right. Lots there, as I mentioned. Uh, the number for this episode is eight. The number for this episode is eight. And I just want to take a second here to thank Aaron Hector. Um, Aaron is a financial planner with Doherty and Bryant in Calgary. And I don't know if Aaron knows this or not, 
but it's really sort of indirectly through him that I got to meet uh, Daryl and Jamie. It's kind of a long story, but basically um, Aaron had uh, put together a bit of uh, research around the services offered by professional trustees. He had shared that with me. Um, I gave somebody else a tip based on that information. That person went and met with uh, Daryl and Jamie and then said, hey, th these guys are great, Jason. Have you met them? I said, no, I just know them sort of uh, secondarily. So yeah, I was really excited to get to meet them. I hope that I can do more work with Daryl and Jamie down the road. I felt like they provided a ton of value. And um, yeah, Aaron, I just will give props again here. Aaron is the, he's incredibly bright. Uh, it's worth checking out his uh, website. I'll put that in the show notes as well, actually. Um, he uh, just a, a thorough thinker on topics of financial planning and, and really gives credit to the idea that there is evidence to be applied to financial planning decisions. I hope you'll join me again in two weeks. We're going back to the regulatory well here. So much change, so much stuff happening on the regulatory side. I have my old friend, Curtis Finley, uh, who used to be a compliance officer, as well as uh, Ed Squarek, who many of you will know he has a background on the regulatory side, uh, joining me for that episode. I'm quite looking forward to that. There's lots to discuss there. Thank you very much and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five-question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner, and from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord, Rennie Wong, and Sushami Pamela Paquette are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals.